Amen. I want to thank uh, Father Newt for this invitation to take the pulpit this morning and uh, on this cold winter morning. I bring you warm greetings from Kaduna, where the temperature is in the 80s. <laughs> it's really warm and cozy there. But the sanctuary here is much warmer than downstairs where we were yesterday. I had to put on my jacket all through. But it's nice to be here, and uh, I want to thank you for giving me this uh, African flavor service. I, I do hope that uh, Nigerians, especially the older ones, will emulate what is happening here. You know, when the younger people try to uh, bring our hymns to their contemporary world, the older ones always kick against it. And uh, I think the solution we have found in Caribbean diocese is to have what we call contemporary service. Uh, the music is terribly loud. Uh, each time I go there, I have to block my ears. But that's the way the young people like it, as long as they are in Christ. I don't think it really matters. So thank you for uh, confirming that what we are trying to do in order to keep the young people within the communion uh, is worth it. I think I will take this message back to say I saw our sisters and brothers and uh, the service, the music is very jazzy. Uh, and, uh, very, very, um, I won't call the name so that's not good for anyone. Now, um, I have chosen to speak to the topic we have for today, which is a place of 40. And I want to begin by sharing this. Some of us know, and others, it may, uh, it may be something uh, new. There is no religion that does not share one ritual or another with another religion, particularly the three Abrahamic religions. And when you look at our Christian year, what we call the church year, you will discover that uh, when you look at Judaism and Islam in particular, they have some of these rituals we also uh, practice within the church, and particularly within the Anglican and the Roman Catholic Church. You all know uh, the relationship between these two uh, big and uh, uh, huge part of the Church of God. Today, the pla a place of 40 actually falls within the Lenten season which begins normally from Ash Wednesday. And by the way, thank you guys for, you preached my sermon for me. <laughs> so what I'm doing now from this school page is to ice the cake. And uh, I hope the, the, the sugar, the icing will not be too much. Now, um, how did we come about this 40, the whole idea of 40? It has a lot of spiritual significance in Judaism and in Christianity. Moses, for example, was with God for 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. What was he doing? He was there in preparation for receiving the Ten Commandments. And that is what we have in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 28. So it is scriptural. Secondly, remember when God called the prophet Jonah to go and warn the people of Nineveh. He resisted, he resented, and was punished for it. And after repentance, he was given the message. Go and deliver this message to the people of Nineveh. And he was told to tell them, in 40 days, if there is no change, their 
would be punishment. That would be God's judgment. That you read from uh, the book of the book, Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4. And of course, uh, Jesus is portrayed in the gospel read to us this morning with a parallel passage in St. Luke's Gospel, also chapter 4, and St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Portrayed as being led into the wilderness by the Spirit for a period of 40 days and 40 nights, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was tested, was tempted in preparation for his ministry. I think of the three versions we have, because St. John's Gospel we not have that, St. Luke's Gospel, uh, is my uh, is my favorite account of the temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. The whole idea was to test him and prepare him for his mission here on the earth. So the early church felt, well, if Moses did that and Jesus Christ himself did it, we should also observe this period of 40 days in preparing ourselves for the celebration of Easter. Like I said earlier on, in Judaism you have something similar. In Islam, uh, about which I can speak uh, with some little bit of authority, they also have something similar to uh, the 40 days we have in Lent. But for the Muslim, it is a period of 30 days. And what he or she should do, what he or she should not do, everything is clearly stated. It's actually commanded in the Quran. And that period is referred to as the Ramadan. <coughs> the, the idea behind Ramadan, so that we can know what our neighbors also practice, and Muslim that the 30 day period is believed by Muslims to be the length of period it did take God to reveal the entire Quran to the heart of Prophet Muhammad. So they're expected to fast, and their, their own mode of fasting, like I said, is clearly stated, is terribly, very, very difficult. But it is a form of discipline to remember those 30 days during which the prophet kept receiving uh, the messages from uh, God himself. For the Muslims, during the 30-day Ramadan period, the most important discipline is for that Muslim, man, woman, boy or girl, to read a portion of the Quran. And the Quran is actually uh, um, uh, uh, written in 30 sections, there are 30 sections in the Quran. So the pious Muslim takes each section per day. So during the 30 day period, a Muslim who is pious, the word, the term they call taqwa, uh, should have read through uh, the entire uh, Quran. And I think that is uh, something we need to take seriously. The girls did say during Lent. Read them. I'll come to that very shortly. And I wonder how many of us actually uh, will say, Well, I have read the entire Bible. Maybe you need to think about that. How many of us here this morning have actually read from Genesis to the Revelation to John? Since we became Christians or since we've been going to church, I think it is something we need to think about. Now, when we therefore observe this period of Lent, our Muslim neighbors are watching us. I don't want to miss that. I did miss it earlier. So when we therefore, as Christians that belong to the Anglican tradition, when we observe the period of Lent, we should note that it is a type or a form of weakness to particularly the Muslims and even the, uh, the Hindus because I know uh, Buddhists also fast, Hindus also fast. So it is our way of saying we also take our faith 
uh, traditions very seriously. So during the period of the 40 days, which began on Ash Wednesday, I want to urge us and I want to ask, have we actually embarked on this spiritual discipline our daughters spoke about this morning? Some argue, and usually it's the lazy ones who don't want to fast. From Ash Wednesday to Easter, there are 45 days. Some say there are 46 days. So what do you mean? There is always a way out, there is always a solution. As Christians, we are not, scripturally speaking, uh, encouraged to fast on Sundays. This is because every Sunday is a celebration. We celebrate the final act of our redemptive history when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So Sunday is important. Actually, the, 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 the celebration of this resurrection changed the entire history of mankind. It becomes, Sunday becomes the first day of the week. Before then, it was different, but there is no time for me to go into that. And so every Sunday we celebrate, and we are not <laughs> So when you remove the Sundays, like most of us do, uh, you have 40 days in Lent. Now, some of you might have read it out. You will see that 40 days and 40 nights is an expression in Hebrew, and it simply means a long time. But we try as much as possible to keep the 40 days. Uh, it's not that we're being legalistic, but it is part of our spiritual uh, development. So how do we prepare ourselves for Easter? Like the girls said, we need to abstain from food. I now speaking to, yes, people of my own skin, but you are westernized and this whole question of spiritual discipline, of denying ourselves food, you find it really difficult. I bet some of you here, you don't even know what hunger is. You don't know what hunger is. This is also part of what we teach in Islam. Fasting helps you to place, to place yourself in the position of the poor. You feel the pangs of hunger. And then when someone says he's hungry, you know exactly, you have a feel, you know, you, you can empathize with that person. I remember my first year at the university in England, I, I've always observed that. My English friend said, Josiah, you mean no drink? You don't drink water? I said, no, no water. Gosh, you will die. And I said, I've never died. <laughs> don't let anybody deceive you. It is possible. It is possible. And it is a command. Jesus Christ went through it. The prophets went through it. The spiritual fathers we have in the early church went through it. And they survived. So I know you have everything here in the West. And some will say, well, you know, as we pass through these uh, confectionery shops, you know, the aroma that comes out, you're tempted. It's all right. It's part of your spiritual discipline. For you to be able to say, no, I am not going to eat. I know yesterday I had a bit of a problem. Uh, a Bible kept saying, you have, you have to eat something. I said, Bernie, I want to eat. I said, I said, everybody around me eat it. I'm used to it. I've made up my mind, I want to eat in order to deny myself food. So I challenge us. If you've never tried it, I urge you, in 2015, do what Jesus actually did. You know, some of us wear this uh, and bands, W, 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 J, D. Yes, what will Jesus do? In Lent, 
Jesus will fast. And I challenge you, are you willing to do what Jesus would have done if he were here physically in the city? But, what therefore, I mean, how does our denying ourselves of food and the physical things we really enjoy, that's not what Christians expect of us. That's the only thing. There is no point in punishing yourself and saying, okay, uh, Bishop Josiah has encouraged us to fast, so I'm going to fast. It's okay to fast because that is for the physical body. For the spiritual body, you must do the things I will just remind you of. Number one is to pray. Pray. Let me backtrack. <clears throat> this fasting, unlike in Islam, that is from dusk to dawn, which some of us do, we also encourage that. However, if you cannot fast from dusk to dawn, you could do it from six in the morning to midday, or from six in the morning to three p.m., or six to six, which is what I do. So what should you do? What are you expected to do in order to, to improve upon your spirituality? Pray. What we encourage our members to do back home is that Ash Wednesday, you have a list of your prayer requests. For this year, I have a member of my church who is suffering from cancer. She went to the UK for treatment, came back to Nigeria, and the whole thing erupted again, so she's now in Cairo. I pray for her every day. Another member, she has a kidney problem. I pray for her every day and I've agreed with the Lord. By Easter, I want to celebrate these girls. I have a member, a bishop, who retired last year and he had a massive heart attack in the United States. Since April, he's not been able to walk. And I've, been, I've agreed with God, I pray for him every day. Peter, God, will walk. He served me for 42 years. Another member of mine, a successful architect, he almost went crippled. He had a massive operation. I will be encouraging him because Dr. said we could do our best. And I keep saying to him, you will walk. So you know, when you have a list of expectations, and you talk to the Lord, you become importunate. You know what I mean by that? Or is it Luke's gospel? You know the friend at night that went banging on the door? Look, my children are sleeping. Oh no, you can't sleep. You become importunate. Keep talking to God. He answers prayers. And I want to, I want to share with you. And I want to encourage you. Get something. Get something and talk to the Lord for yourself, for your neighbor, for your children, for everyone, for the church. This church must grow. This church needs to grow. There are many people around here who don't come to church. You can pray for them on a daily basis. And I assure you, God answers prayers. I want, I'm tempted to give you a testimony. And I'll give you this testimony because Father has said, I can pray for 20 minutes. <laughs> Every year at January, I usually go for my complete medical check. And you know, once you are 60, as a man, like the women with uh, breast cancer, they tell us you must go for, uh, what is it called? Oh yes, thank you for the usual holiday. And I've been okay, and sometimes, sometimes this year I said, look, I think you have a life. I said, no problem with that. I know hundreds of people who live with it. Uh, but the fear is if it becomes cancerous. So I said, look, I want to go for biopsy. I don't believe in this test. And lo and behold, it was beginning. So I went to the hospital, and the uh, 
the consultant said, Dr. Sam of God, it's not nuclear medicine. And you need almost $60,000. Did you hear me? $60,000. US dollars, not Canadian dollars. And I said, well, I'll go for that. He looked at me and said, you said, where do you get the money from? I said, you know who pays me my salaries? He said, I said, God, I don't take salary from the diocese. Since I became bishop, God sustains me. I said, I'll go for that. So I prayed and called up my friend of a small church in the Diocese of Connecticut. They adopted me when I was studying there. And I said, John, I have a problem. What's the problem? And I told him. He said, I will pray. Brothers and sisters, he called me back two days. Within 24 hours, six people in that parish put together $32,000. Oh, yeah. It's good. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know this God? This God, he loves us. He loves us. And he wants us hail and pretty. I tell you, I've not had any, uh, what do you call it after operation? Side effects? No. And I wasn't opened up. It's all nuclear. You see, the robot would come and look at you and go back. And I was singing. The first time I got in there, usually it's 20 minutes per day for five days. And I chose gospel music. And the first song was, Lord, I'm coming home. I said, no, I'm not coming home now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I encourage you. I'm, I'm a person of prayer. And I know it works. Prayer works. No matter what it is, it works. The second thing we need to do is to talk, to commune with God by listening to him. And that is what the girl said the Bible. Anglicans, and I'm speaking as one, I've always been an Anglican. My, my father was an Anglican priest. We don't know the Bible. We don't know the Bible. Make it a habit this Lenten season. I told you, the Muslim reads the entire Quran in 30 days. 95 chapters. In 30 days, 97. In 30 days, I wonder how much of the Bible we know. We are good at read, write, reading literature books. Oh, Father Canute has written this. Uh, Bishop Colin has done that. Canon Barry has done It's okay. You should read the experiences, but there is no substitute for the Word of God. I urge you, brothers and sisters, you cannot survive with 20 minute sermon on a Sunday. We need to hear God speak, and God still speaks. Systematic study of the word. And the third leg is that you must do works of mercy. They talked about giving. You must get out of yourself. Freely you have received, freely give. So, these three, works of mercy. Young people, organize yourselves. Assist the homebound, the old people in our midst. Visit them. Help them to clean their homes during this period of Lent. Because if you fast, you must pray. Praying, studying the word without works of mercy is not complete. We need to get up and show and demonstrate the love of God. Now, this love of God could be done together. What we do in Kaduna Diocese is, most of us skip two meals, no breakfast, no lunch. So we calculate how much we will spend. And then, you know, some argue, look, Bishop, I buy my food, food in bulk. You can't escape. You know how much you spend <laughs> on breakfast. You know how much you spend for lunch. That money we put together every Wednesday when we go for midweek prayer meeting and communion. We put that money down. And we decided three years ago uh, that that money we will use to give inmates in the uh, uh, high security prisons uh, IT uh, skills. 
So we pay the, uh, the, 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 the teachers who teach them, and we put together almost $10,000 uh, every year from our lending collection. It goes, that's our ministry. That is our uh, uh, rich, our service, you know, works of mercy to the people in the prisons. So, brothers and sisters, we can do the same. You know, our partner down, which is coming to diocese in the UK, when they heard that, they did something which really touched all of us in the diocese two years ago. The money that came from the diocese, they bought us for our rural work, a jeep. You know, a truck with which the doctors and the nurses go into the rural areas to give medical uh, treatment to the people in the But that's what Christianity is all about. That's what Latin season is all about. Jesus Christ came and died for us so that you and I might have life, as we, we, we sang not too long ago, to show us the way. And brothers and sisters, this period of Lent is the best opportunity we have. So, in summary, let me say this. If you have never fasted, I plead with you, try it. You don't have to begin from dusk to dawn. Do it halfway. And then you begin, even physically, if you feel healthier. You know, a lot of us are overweight. I've been reading these days, obesity is a problem you have in the West. We don't have that in the developing part of the world. <laughs> you see little children, they are too fat. You know, the, the older ones, they are also too fat. You ask them to walk. After walking for, one minute, uh, for five minutes, they are panting. Lent is an opportunity for you to share all this weight. And you know one secret. After Lent, it will be difficult to go back. So you get even healthier physically. And of course, the non-Christians around you, when they see you doing that, they will ask you, you're not eating. You have an opportunity to share the gospel. Why are you doing it? Jesus did it. Why did Jesus do it? So that he would accomplish his ministry to set me free from my sins. There is no gospel that you and thirdly, what you put together, give it away, so that people will know the love of Christ. I want to say again that, you know, Muslims also have this box of mercy I'm talking about. That is what they call the card of Saul, that is uh, the tithe from fasting. That money does not go to the individual. The individual is encouraged to give it away, just as we do. So, a place 40, it's an opportunity, brothers and sisters, to improve upon our spirituality. God says, put me to the test. Put him to the test. He, he gives us that opportunity. I always test him. And I want to share with you, he has never failed. I pray that this period of Lent, we will all at least grow deeper in our relationship with him, our relationship with one another.